I'm really excited that we have with us today Dr. Jonathan Gruden. Um, he is our speaker, our ISR speaker this afternoon. And he's, a, he's a principal researcher at Microsoft and an affiliate professor in the Information School at the University of Washington. And many of you know Jonathan from his time here at UCI as well. He was in uh, ICS. Um, Jonathan has been a leading light in HCI and CSCW for many years, and he has too many awards to list, but I want to mention one. Um, his, one of his early papers from 1988 on enterprise adoption of technology just received the CSCW Lasting Impact Award, and the award will be presented at CSCW in February. Congratulations. Um, and I remember this paper really well because when I was making my transition from anthropology to HCI in the early 90s, I started an empirical study of spreadsheet users. It was my first study in my new identity. And I didn't know where to look, and I found this paper by some guy named Jonathan Gruden that <laughs> talked about spreadsheets. And I was so excited. It was a great paper. Um, and I cited it, so I think I made an early contribution to your last <laughs> <laughs> And uh, finally, I want to mention a fun fact about Jonathan, which is that he attended the Woodstock Festival in 1969 as a teenager. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes, that paper, um, I was working in an enterprise and, uh, as a developer, not even as a researcher, and I uh, ran into some problems there, which led to that paper and led to my interest in enterprise adoption, which is related to the topic that I'll be speaking of here. Oh, yes, I knew that I was going to forget to do that, so. Um, <coughs> but before I get into the enterprise adoption, I do want to have a prelude uh, to sort of set the stage for what I think is the most important thing to um, uh, to keep in mind when you're looking at the adoption of technology or the anticipated adoption of technology. And first, the, I think the key issue in HCI is that we have an immovable object and an irresistible force. Uh, the movable object being human nature, you know, our cognitive, our perceptual, our emotional, our social systems, which don't really change very much. Uh, my friend Victor Kapitalinen argues that we can still perfect human nature a little bit, but uh, in general, most of our, our we have a, a wired-in capabilities, that's the immovable object, and then we've got technology, this irresistible force. And if you just look at the way technology is developing, you can imagine almost anything is possible, but it's the constraints that human beings uh, and our, and our <coughs> nature bring to bear that make it interesting and, and make it not possible for anything to work. And so my Okay, so that is the that is the concept, the, the context here. The prelude I want to, to I just want to spend a few minutes talking about technology change. How many people here would say that they really understand exponential growth and technology change and Moore's law? Um, anybody want to? I mean, we've all heard about it. Gary's Gary's raised his hand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but. So we understand it, but there have been studies that show that people reason very poorly about exponential growth, and even when you give them graphical information, if anything, they do worse. And I was wondering, and because I've come to the conclusion that we underestimate a lot of the impacts of technology adoption that were due to this rapid growth, um, I'm just curious about why it is that we misattribute these effects to them, and I concluded that Maybe it's because of the way that we typically see it graphically represented. So here are two depictions of Moore's Law. The one on the left shows, just shows the growth, but you can only really see the first few iterations will fit, and it looks almost linear. We're very good at, we see a lot of linear growth around the world. Uh, we're used to reasoning about that. That looks almost linear. On the right, you see the log linear plot, and it does look very linear. Um, and I. And so the conclusion I came to is we need a different way to visualize it. And I just want to run through this very quickly and leave it with you. So here are 10 years of Moore's Law and related legislation. Now I'm going to show it again, and I'm going to go through it. Um, and what you see is I'm changing the y-axis so that you can actually visualize it as we go through the effect of Moore's Law. And what you see is the same curved shape with a much longer tail. So I'm going to go through it once more. 
And here's where I was working as a software developer in the early 1980s. And there was this bomb overhead. And when you look at the, the, the curve there, you might conclude that you will never get up there. Um, and the bomb was a graphical user interface. I was working on command names and command abbreviations and command interfaces. And there was that, that bomb, and it came, and suddenly all this work that we were doing on command naming and abbreviation, nobody was going to build on it. Nobody was going to use it. Um, and we changed. And some people that I was working with got sort of depressed about this and left the field. And others of us changed what we were working on. And so what caused that bomb? Here's I, I, We'll just go through the example of computer graphics. Here, I've depicted on a log linear scale all of the, the devices that, in which you could actually put up a graphical user interface and how much they cost at different times. So Ivan Sutherland built the first one on a TX2, hugely expensive device at MIT. The PDPs came along, Alto and the Mac. Computer graphics researchers followed that. There was a split um, at one point where the computer graphics researchers were interested in building things for people, for HCI, continued on moving down that curve. The ones who were really interested in, in photorealism had to stick with more expensive machines and follow that curve. So you had people, Ron Becker and Jim Foley and, 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 and Bill Buxton and others uh, came down into the HCI camp. Meanwhile, you had the HCI people who were really focused on interfaces for devices that were widely usable by lots of people. And so they followed those two paths, and they collided with the, with the Fat Mac. They collided in 1985 with the Fat Mac, um, and that was the bomb that sort of changed what I was working on back then. So now I just want to ask you a quick question, which is, if this were an accurate depiction of machines that could support a graphical user interface, when could you actually get one for free, for no cost at all? <laughs> yeah? Never really. Never really. OK, very good. You're only the second person. Usually, people say, just about now. And of course, this uh, you know the second person that said that in a talk, the first one was Don Norman. Um, because this is a log linear plot, you never hit the x The x-axis here represents 10. And in fact, it did continue down that curve. And we're now heading towards the $1 uh, device that will support a graphical user interface. And, and so, um, so very good. So some people are reasoning about it, but what, as I said, what did happen was we had the, uh, that came along, and there were other bombs that came along in the mid-90s that affected the audio industry, the film, the, the film industry, the music industry. And here we are, we're looking back, you see, yeah, Moore's Law is out there, we all know about it, it's really going nowhere, but there are these bombs overhead. And if I had more than 45 minutes, I would tell you what some of the ones are, but they're but since I don't, you're going to have to think about that and figure out what are the bombs coming along that we should be watching out for, what are going to be disruptive. So my last slide on this um, prelude are basically these are different industries that were affected by the, this exponential growth that the semiconductor people uh, produced. First, it had an effect on hardware, of course. It then had an effect on software. The software skills I learned early in my career when memory was incredibly expensive were not the ones that were valued later. Um, the user interface changes I mentioned, the consumer behavior. And finally, organizations and institutions have more inertia, uh, but they are uh, going to be affected um, as well. OK, so now the main focus of my talk is social media and the enterprise. This sort of is not the, the galaxy out there colored in. It's actually the, the web um, activity on the web. And I became interested in this, um, in this area of research about uh, almost 15 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, when I went to a talk given by some two anthropologists at Microsoft who described what technology students were using. And I was stunned because they were suddenly using technologies that I was not using and probably would never use quite the way they were since they were starting to use these uh, while they were still forming their social identities and social networks. Um, and so that included instant messaging, wikis, blogs, uh, social networking sites. And so for the last 10 years, up until two years ago, I spent, um, and still ongoing in part, I focused not on how students are using these technologies, 
But having gone through the enterprise skepticism about email um, early in my career, I realized that these technologies would probably be received skeptically by enterprises that would think these are ways students waste time. Um, and, but I knew that eventually people, young people coming into the organizations or adventurous people using them would figure out ways to use them to work more effectively in many cases. And so I've looked at that process and how over time the attitudes and behaviors in organizations around these new technologies uh, develop. Um, not only the technologies, but of course the new behaviors and skills that go, that come along with these. Um, so first it's in the consumer space and then it will come in to enterprises uh, with the web and web 2.0. So I'm going to talk about, so I've looked at all of these, uh, the technologies that I mentioned, I'm just going to talk about two, the wikis and social networking sites. So first I'll say what some of the points are that emerge from this work. One is that when you bring in a new technology, it's going to, particularly for communication and collaboration, into an organization that's already uh, has ways of communicating, it has document repositories and so forth, a new communication is going to disrupt the existing group processes. Another key point is that different people in the organization have different views about what the technology could be used for and also have different preferences, different ways of using the technology and they often don't align. Um, and then finally for these technologies that affect communication and collaboration, it's often very difficult to prove that it has an effect on the bottom line, that there's a return on an investment, which is something that enterprises are extremely focused on. And so for each of these sort of challenges, there's also a lesson. One is that if you want to do an experiment with a new technology in an organization, find a group, a new activity or a new group that's developed in that organization, kind of like an internal startup, uh, and try it there because they don't already have known authorities on particular topics, known repositories, known uh, you know communicate distribution lists or other communication uh, tools that are in use. As far as the, the second one goes, I think that it's you need to get do different requirement analyses for each of these three groups at least, and also educate them to the fact that they are going to be that managers need to realize that the individual contributors may well like features that they don't like or find them useful and vice versa. And finally, um, the last one is just very difficult in enterprises, but you have to really focus on the costs and the benefits that, are, uh, that only indirectly will affect productivity. Um, okay, so before going to the new technologies, I'll just briefly go through the early example of email um, and then the parallels with instant messaging. So, Email in 1985, when I was working in the company that led to writing the paper in 88, um, people now wouldn't necessarily realize that these characteristics described it. It was used mostly by students. There was no directory of email addresses. People had sort of arcane strings, so you had to really know what the email address was to reach people. Um, email clients weren't interoperable. Memory cost way too much to save email, so the conversations were ephemeral and and people used email as the informal medium to writing formal memos in organizations. So it's chosen for informality, and there was a lot of distrust. Even as late as the mid-90s, or uh, some leading organizational theorists were saying that email was a productivity killer in organizations, and once organizations realized that, they would start ripping it out. So there's a lot of skepticism. When I went to work for this company in 19... 83, um, they had email on the machines and they, and they, and it was not being used. And I asked my manager, why don't we use this? And he said, why? And I said, well, if I wanted to get an answer to a question from somebody across the, in a different building. And he said, then you should just write a formal memo and give it to me and it'll go up the management chain and it'll go down to him and the answer will come back really fast, like three days, maybe five days. And he said, and by the way, don't be seen using your keyboard very much, that's secretarial. This was a high-tech company, too. This was uh, on the East Coast. Um, and so, so I said, OK, I'll learn to write formal memos. And I, and I continued typing, and I didn't, uh, using the keyboard, and I didn't make it into management in that organization. But there was this distrust. 
that continued. And of course, all that changed. Now, the interesting thing about IM 20 years later was that it still had many of those characteristics when I was started looking at it a little bit before this. Um, conversations, just as email had been the informal option, conversations were, uh, uh, IM was informal, conversations were ephemeral. And of course, all of those things started changing and have changed. You can now subpoena IM, and we see it, you know, <laughs> it does show up in the, in the newspapers, what people said on IM. Um, and just, 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 to, just to underline the fact that there really was that skepticism, these are excerpts from one of the leading consulting companies. Uh, I just kept track of what they were saying about IM, and it was just a productivity drain, a qua communication quagmire threatening productivity, misuse, and overload. So there really was that skepticism towards IM, but most organizations have now come to terms with IM. So the point, so a point here is that we saw it with email, we saw it with instant messaging, and to some extent we see that some of the same patterns in, in some organizations with social networking sites to a large extent, but we also, there are some, some differences. Okay, so wikis. So this is a study I did with an intern, Erica Poole, who's now at Penn State. Um, we were studying wiki use in organizations that included a number of large organizations in different industries, uh, as well as startup companies. We did quantitative, we collected, um, we collected data on wikis from, from servers, and we also did interviews of people involved in using wikis, wikis that, that died, wikis that, that were that were <coughs> active use. We also interviewed the people who maintain the, the, the servers, um, as well as managers of some of these groups, and, uh, and yeah, in, in a range of different settings. And at the high level, what we found was that there was a lot of appeal of wikis. There were far more wikis in some of the organizations <coughs> we looked at than we would have guessed. And there were some very successful wikis, and thousands of dead wikis, and they were that, that were that had many had been uh, initiated, hoping that they would succeed. Some were just experiments. Um, and what we, when we, as a result of the, the data and the surveys and the interviews, what we found was that once an organization had chosen a wiki, there were three major challenges that they faced. Um, one was that people tend to think of wikis as being flexible. And in fact, when you set them up, they, you, can, you, you do have a great deal of flexibility in creating them. But after, uh, after they're in place, they can be quite rigid, they can be hard to change. So if you want to, you get, you have, basically you have a global namespace. Um, if you want to merge two wikis, that's, that's very difficult. If you want to split them apart, that's problematic. So it's just over time, uh, they, they, they require constant gardening or maintenance to to find broken links and, and, and so forth. So the initial, uh, although initially easy to use for many, they still require a little bit of programming ability, but there are lots of pains um, in using the wikis over time. You also had the problems that the, the in, in many cases, you, the, the formatting of wikis was hard to get information out if you wanted to pull out records and give them to either a regulator or to a customer. It was very hard to get it out if it was in the, the wiki format. Another problem is the one that I mentioned, which is that positioning the wiki in an existing uh, system of communication and collaboration and an existing culture was difficult. So even if somebody who was sort of the authority in an area or, or the leading person responsible for an area set up a wiki and invited people to come in and contribute and edit it, a lot of people felt a little uneasy that maybe the person didn't really want their comments in there and maybe the person would eventually be accountable for what was in there. And so, so a lot of times wikis were set up, but people were um, uh, uneasy about getting into them when there was already this, this, this uh, organizational structure around them. And then the final, the final point here, again, is this difference between the manager and individual contributor expectations and behaviors. <coughs> and later I'll talk a little bit more about how uh, an analysis that il illustrates how that comes about and, uh, and the issues that arise. So these are reasons why managers <laughs> liked the wiki, in, uh, the wiki concept. 
they did have this view that unlike a blog, which was sort of chronologically ordered, wikis could be more flexible. They also saw a big factor in wiki adoption was that managers saw it as a possibility for managing a project, for being able to, they have several groups and they could, they could um, see the status of deadlines approaching, they could see the status of the activity of different groups. One might be getting behind and maybe could use some more resources directed towards it. Um, another is the potential for knowledge management. Companies that, this came up quite a bit also with Microsoft's customers who saw that they have a group of engineers or a group of other professionals who are retiring. If they could get all the knowledge out of the <coughs> professionals and into the wiki, then they would still have it when the people have left. They're also going to have to hire people to replace them. And so they, maybe if they have wiki technology in there, it'll be more appealing to younger, um, younger hires. The reason why the individual contributors like the wikis, and they were the ones that generally had to actually use them for them to be used, was not for these reasons. It was just to support ad hoc communication, opportunistic communication, to put up answers to frequently asked questions, to put up things that they discovered that might be useful to everyone in the group. So now I will talk about the, about briefly about Henry Mintzberg. This is when I, I worked at MCC and we tried to, we didn't have any background in organizational theory, but so a group of us started reading papers, um, sort of classic papers, and everybody in that organization uh, when we came to this particular paper, this was the favorite paper. Um, and he basically argues, he's not talking about technology, but he's, he basically is making the case that organizations of, of a certain size uh, tend to have these five different groups within the organization. They work differently, they're rewarded differently, they each tend to strive for dominance in organizations. Some organizations, one group tends to actually be the more powerful than other organizations, another does. So a startup, <coughs> It's a strategic apex, so executives, it's very top down. For a divisionalized company, the middle line is more powerful. For a professional bureaucracy, like maybe the university, the faculty have a lot, or a hospital, the surgeons, or the faculty have a lot of power, um, a lot of influence. And you also have the techno structure, the people who design the work processes, not necessarily technical, not necessarily around technology, but so for instance, in a manufacturing facility, the people who really design the, 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 the work processes are, are very um, central. And, and then you, everybody else in the organization is in the support staff. And what I found in the different technologies I've looked at, and I did not go in looking for this, uh, but that it is the case that, in fact, if all of these groups use the same technology, they use it in very different ways. And features that one of these groups likes another group often dislikes intensely, and vice versa. And the reason is because the structure of their day, the, the way that they work is different. So the individual contributors are often, and are, you know, and there are exceptions, but they're often put together uh, closely because they need to interact a lot informally. So communication is really key amongst team members, and so that is, uh, one reason they're, they're often co-located and why we're very focused on communication technologies when they're not. Managers do communicate, but managers are primarily focused on sharing structured information in the form of documents and spreadsheets and slide decks uh, and so forth, often information that's been produced by people in their groups. Executives do share information and do communicate some, but they're more focused on coordinating the activity of different groups in the organization. Another difference is how much time is spent in meetings. So individual contributors are often um, spend relatively little time in meetings, more time on their work. Managers have a lot of meetings, and executives can be scheduled years out in advance. And when you start looking at what features might be used in, a, say, a calendar system or other systems, you can see that there are uh, potentially large differences there. Another is how much um, authority they have to delegate work. So executives can delegate a lot of activity. Uh, managers can de delegate some, and individual contributors typically don't delegate much. And so, um, for example, in one paper, not one of mine, that looked at 
web use by uh, years ago, looked at web use by different um, people in organizations. They interviewed people in these different categories, and what they asked them to do is to save some of the tasks that they might spend a half hour using the web to, to work on uh, until they could come in and watch them doing it. When they came to executives, it was like they would never spend a half an hour on the web. If they saw a site that looked interesting, if somebody had communicated that this was something they might look at, they would simply send it to one of the, the people that they, you know, one of their reports and have them look in it and give them a report on it. So again, but then you can see how if that's how you're using it, you might have different tools that would actually support that, like tra tracking what you've sent out and who's, who's got it and so forth. Finally, um, how sensitive the activities, the work-related activities are of people in these different categories is, is another issue. So individual contributors, typically the work-related activity that they do is visible to everybody in the organization. Executives, who they're meeting with, what they're discussing is very sensitive. In many cases, you will not see an open calendar typically um, on, a, on an executive's machine. Managers are in between where what they're doing can be a little sensitive, but there's huge benefits to them in knowing what their peers, other managers are doing, where they are, you know, what their schedules are. So they're sort of balancing those. So just to finish up with wikis here, what executives liked uh, in a number of the places that we looked at Startups, I would say, that were just wikis were very successful in startups. Um, in the large organizations, the, they had these different goals of capturing the knowledge of people who are about to retire, locating expertise in the company, recruiting young employees, and only the last one was significant. You know, they, they thought the people who are about to retire, if we can get all their knowledge into the wiki, that would just be great. But the people who were about to retire, first of all, a lot of them were planning to retire and then sell back their knowledge by consulting part-time for the company, and otherwise they tend to be older, the last, you know, less inclined to actually pick up and learn a new technology. Secondly, they might worry that if they got all their knowledge into the system a little too soon, they might be asked to retire before they were quite ready, so, so it just, it really was not going to happen. Um, and there are well-known problems in expertise location, which actually, there have been PhDs written here that identify those problems, so I won't go through that. The managers, again, there was this project dashboard, uh, and I'll just give one example of an extremely successful wiki we found, and we interviewed uh, seven or eight individual contributors who were describing how they were using it for ad hoc communication um, effectively. It, and, but they, and without us prompting, they all came, when we asked them what could be improved, they all identified one problem, which was a guy who had, created the wiki, had left the project. He had served as kind of a benevolent dictator, gardener, fixed broke link, broken links, and kept people using consistent formats. Uh, but he had left the project, and then they put a woman in charge of it half time in this gardening capability, but then she had been reassigned. And now nobody was doing that. It was just starting to get seedy and breaking. And, and so at that point, we scheduled a meeting with the second level manager who didn't know what the meeting was about. We walked in and told him it was about the wiki, and his face fell, and he said it had so much promise and it was such a disappointment. Um, and the reason why was because he had this project dashboard view, and so when he would look before a deadline to see how the groups were doing, here's one group that has almost nothing in there. Here's another group that has lots of stuff, but when he looks through it, he's not sure he can find the information that he really wants in there. Then here's a group that was actually doing a good job until the deadline approached, and then there's nothing. And the reason why is because with the deadline approaching, when they had some information, they run down the hall telling everybody and say, well, put it in the wiki later. So to him, it was a, it was a failure. Um, for individual contributors, and the other thing, the managers had to handle all the disruptions. The executives liked it. The individual contributors liked it. When the problems arose, it was dumped in the manager's lap. And so, you know, and so we had, we had high-level people who talked about the ice age mentality of these managers who were opposed to the wikis, while well, managers uh, just had to deal with these problems. In the case of the individual contributors, they were using it, um, but it does present challenges there too. They do have to learn some new skills if they're not very technical. And there are also issues if you're contributing to a wiki, are you gonna get credit for it, right? It's a big wiki and nobody's gonna look to see who the authors are of everything in it. Um, and so that, the whole, bottom-up sort of democratic 
Uh, appeal of wikis also has, has some downsides. And now I'm going to talk about social networking sites, of which there are a lot out there. And what I've done there is um, once a year invited 1,000 Microsoft employees, so this is just Microsoft, 1,000 Microsoft employees randomly picked from the address book, the only condition being that they haven't been in it before because they might have been influenced by taking it before, and that their names weren't Bill Gates or Steve Ballmer, because <laughs> nobody would believe that that was actually random. So, um, and so we sent out the survey, we had an incentive to take it, namely a lottery ticket for a device like a connector, something else in the early years. Um, and we got a very high return rate, over 400, around 450. Uh, and it was asking them about their attitudes towards the publicly accessible social network site, networking sites and their behaviors around them. And so we did this, we've done this annually. I don't have, I have, we have 200, 2013 data as well. Although it's not in the charts, but I have, I just looked at it actually on the plane down here. I do know um, I can fill in there. And among the questions, so we asked, so we got demographic information on them, so we could look at how their attitudes and behaviors vary depending on their role in the company, their age, how long they've been in the company, you know, their level of management, where they were geographically located. Microsoft has people all around the globe, whether their team was co-located or distributed. So, um, and now, and then of course we can look at it, how it's changed over time. One of the things I was particularly interested in was, uh, can social, net, do they think social networking sites could be used for fun, um, for personal socializing, for external professional networking, and for networking within the company? And, and that's these public sites. Um, so is it useful uh, internally? And I should just remind you that in 2008, that was a long time ago, and now we come to the exponential growth. I mean, Facebook went from no but from virtually nobody except for a few students to over a billion users in just several years. So in 2008, it was just shortly after it had been released to companies for use to the public. And so we knew, at that point, we actually knew Facebook used to have a sort of organization profile. And so we knew that about a third of the people at Microsoft had Facebook accounts, but had no idea how they were using them, whether they were using them for work purposes, whether they were talking about work-related things to the general public, no, no idea. So here is some data. Um, this is the percent of all employees who use the three major sites daily. And so what you see is uh, Facebook, over half of the employees are using it daily. And this is con these, these threads have continued. So, so the Facebook is still plateaued there. Uh, the Twitter is gone from 11% to 11.6% in 2013, and LinkedIn, daily use of LinkedIn has continued to rise. It's now 24%. So Twitter plateaued, which you might not guess from just looking at the media um, reports. Now, I should back up and say something about, one thing about Microsoft, which is we can think of it as an unrepresentative high-tech company, and of course it is, but over half of Microsoft is engaged in, in, is in the marketing and sales division and in, um, in, in operational support. So only a minority are actually engineers and, and directly working on engineering. So here is uh, how occasional use, you actually see a different story there. Twitter use um, has continued to rise and it's now 33%. The same pattern, Facebook is sort of plateau, but at 76%. And LinkedIn is continuing to move up on occasional use. You know, when we also did interviews of, of um, about 100 people uh, over the years who filled out the survey to get more detail, mostly the first year and in 2012 to get more detailed information, because there's some questions that weren't answered, like what are all those LinkedIn people doing? Most people said they're probably looking for jobs. Well, that's not the case. Uh, it turns out it's much more heavily used in the sales and marketing areas where they're using it for customer contacts and customer exploration. And some of the engineers, you know, use even within the engineering group, some engineers, for instance, a couple engineers would like to get the job invitations, telling them about jobs, even though they weren't on the job market, to see what skills 
were being sought in those jobs, and then go out and if they didn't have one of those skills, they could go out and train and, and actually become, uh, you know, learn that language, learn Python, or learn whatever it was that interesting jobs seemed to, to want. So that if, so maybe at Microsoft it would turn out to be useful, or maybe if they did at some future date, decide to look for another job, they would have that skill. So there were different ways that people used the sites. And another thing that we needed to look at in interviews was why is Twitter occasional use going up, but not daily use? Why does it say it's so low for daily use? And it's because you know, I've got a paper uh, that goes into more detail, but essentially people are using Twitter, a lot of people are using it to monitor, um, periodically monitor news. People from Egypt might, you know, if there's some events going on in Cairo, they might get on and look at it. People who, uh, if there's some commotion in their neighborhood, they might go, go out to Twitter and type in, you know, um, one guy, for example, said it was suddenly a police in, in uh, up in Wallingford and in, in, in Seattle area, there were police all over the place and sirens, and so I went to Twitter and looked at hashtag Wallingford to see what was going on, and found out that there was some sort of a, a bomb threat to somebody in a building just down the street from him, and he said he was able to contribute to that Twitter stream because he looked out and he saw this police robot going towards, <laughs> towards the house, and so he tweeted, tweeted that. Uh, another guy, an executive down, down around, actually down here, um, went, took his family to, to not work related in these cases, but he took his family to Disneyland and the parking lot was closed. And so he didn't know what was going on. He got on, checked Twitter, and found out that yes, Disneyland was open and where he could get free parking. So, so the people use it for more pointed reasons. This is sure, and this is a measure of how many people try things and then completely abandon them. What's interesting here is that Twitter, and this is Twitter and LinkedIn have extremely low churn. So you read these media stories about people abandoning Facebook, well maybe 18, you know, it, it, it's very interesting, I won't go into the whole issue of the, of the teenagers who are not represented in the Microsoft workforce, but um, Facebook is, uh, has very little churn, and um, the others have higher, and in fact for, for a lot of these, uh, the 2013, for almost all the others, the 2013 data, except for the, the, the big three are still at the same level, Twitter uh, there and, and Facebook and LinkedIn. The others are all actually showing more churn. So these new ones came in, but they have not had the same sort of sticking. This is a, um, this gets at the issue of what do you think it's good for and shows that over time. And basically for, the, for external professional uh, networking, that had really rose over time. The other two were high all along. Internal networking is still not 50% think it's useful inside the company, but it has gone up. Um, and of course, in the interviews, we found lots of reasons, uh, lots of ways that people do use it uh, internally or think they're using it internally to uh, work more effectively and more efficiently. And a big part for many is just knowing what's going on in group members and other people they work with so that they can go in and greet them and, and sort of work more efficiently in meetings with them. Okay, so that was that. One interesting change here is that over time, in the beginning, the managers were more suspicious about the utility of social networking inside the organization. And although individual contributors have risen, the managers have risen uh, much more rapidly, so they're now more open to its use, seeing its benefits and in internal use. And some of that's because individual contributors internally, some of them, a lot of the developers, work mostly with people very close by and maybe have less need to interact with them um, at all through social networking. Okay, well, I'll move now towards the last uh, topic, which is the, the concerns that people have. And so we ask people, how do they make, how much use of access control do they uh, make, access control settings, which there were not too many of in the early days, and what are their concern levels about the use of social networking sites? And so what you see is that on the whole, people have a few use access controls a little, and they have minor concerns, but uh, the number with no concerns has dropped, and the use of access controls rose. Similarly, the people uh, with no 
concerns has dropped, and I think major concerns has sort of plateaued. But we had an open-ended question to ask people what their concerns were, and we brought this up in the interviews, and, in two, and what we saw was a big change in what people were concerned about if they had concerns. And so, in 2008, it was complete, the, the overwhelming source of concern was around the fact that these social network sites, uh, including, uh, in particular, Facebook, transcended firewalls. So, they would start off with just friends, and then some colleagues were friends, and then other colleagues would ask to join, their parents would ask to join, their kids would be asked to be friends, their customer, you know, one guy, uh, sort of typical story was that he used to, he used to post about parties he went to with his friends, but then his customers, he was in sales, his customers asked to be his Facebook friend, he couldn't turn them down, but now he didn't really feel comfortable talking about the parties, and his actual friends were saying, hey, you used to be a fun guy, what happened to you? Um, so he was very conflicted about this. So they were just, what do I do when my vice president asks to be my Facebook friend? You know, people, um, so these, the, the boundaries, the fact that, that it, was, it was crossing boundaries was just a huge issue in 2008. And by 2012, it had disappeared as an issue. There, in 2010, there was sort of a, a shift um, in, in what people who were concerned were concerned about. Why did it go away? It went away because people found out how to handle it. Uh, the designers helped a little by adding some access control features and grouping, but people didn't tend to use them as some people used them and others, others didn't. It went away. Um, one of the factors was people started to use multiple social networking sites. In the early days, it was kind of all or none. I had MySpace and then I had Facebook. You know, it, was, it was just very, uh, very few people had multiple sites. But people were adding sites and they were adding like Facebook pages or groups or LinkedIn groups, and so they were really segmenting out their, their um, different groups that they wanted to communicate with, and Twitter, and in different ways. You'd be surprised. Some people actually were using LinkedIn not so much just for professional, but, but for more social. Some people may, would let anybody into Facebook but restricted Twitter. Some people did it the opposite. Um, so, and other people used other of the social networking sites. So they really, the boundary, those boundary concerns disappeared, and a new boundary uh, concern came in. But this, this is just one more slide that gets at the issue of the, of the shift in concerns, and I've just segmented it out into the, the, the men and the women, um, and what happened in the middle there, in particular, was that the women who typically had had equal, or in earlier and other studies, even more concerns about social networking sites, they actually uh, dropped dramatically relative to the men. So women had a, had a lot less concern about social networking, and they made more use of access control features. So what basically was happening was they were using the access control features to get things the way they wanted them, and the guys weren't doing that, and then were more anxious about it. Um, so it was, uh, it was um, so un unexpected uh, finding there, but um, Okay, so what, we, what came up in the first interview we did in 2012 was, um, at the end of the interview, I asked the, the senior manager, uh, product manager, if there was anything I hadn't said, asked in the interview that I should have. You know, was there anything that was left out? And she said, yes. And she went, this is an excerpt from her riff. She says, she has this concern. Um, I don't know how Facebook is using my information. Uh, the marketing ads on Facebook seem to match my typed insights creepy. Now, this was in 2012. We certainly are, have heard that more. But uh, she says that she had this great analogy where I asked, I said, you know, she, okay, so she says, uh, I said, she said that after the, when I typed in the marketing ads match, I said, well, yeah, when I go to the supermarket, you know, I, they get my information when I buy, and, and then they send me discounts on the things I buy. I think that's kind of good. And she said, yeah. But there, in that case, um, it's uh, you know you've been shopping there, you've got a relationship with them, and they're doing something that helps you. This so she gave this parallel. It's like if she's having lunch with somebody and is looking for a house, and then some random person back there comes up and says, "I have five, five, five houses." It's super creepy. This the words creepy, unsettling, weird came up over and over in interviews with people, um, and so. But 
they did not plan to abandon using Facebook. The other side of it is that they saw it now as inevitable. You know, if I'm going to have a party, this is the way that our friends uh, uh, organize parties. Um, what am I going to use? Evite, you know, which like kids use. I mean, so basically, people saw it as creepy but inevitable, and and that was reflected in the churn data, which we just saw nobody actually abandoning Facebook. So this was a, another senior uh, manager who said. Um, her partner was trying to convince her to get on Facebook, and she said she uh, was resisting, and when I asked why, this is what she said, that she just sees it as a time sink, but she sees it as an inevitable, she, she's just holding out as long as she can. And so, it's a different set of boundary um, problems. In the, in the first case, it was, it was managing the boundary between you and the other people who you want to deal with. Now what they're talking about is boundary, managing the boundary between them and the service providers. And so at, at some level you can see that managing boundaries is a common, um, is a common issue that's come up here. It's with your social groups, with your service providers. You know, in, in some sense the issue is around NSA, you know, around intelligence agencies collecting all of our social networking data and IM traffic and so forth. That's the boundary between us and another organization. So at one level, they're, they're, um, that is an issue. And my feeling uh, about the, about the uh, social technologies in general is that this, um, that part of our nature is that uh, we do need these boundaries, and we need these boundaries developmentally. As, you, you know, as kids, the, the boundary of people that you interact with and have to interact with changes. When you go into an organization, the same thing happens. So these boundaries are really sort of an integral part of our social development. And technology just allows, just breaks through these boundaries, allows more and more visibility of actions and behaviors. And so, you, so I think this is an example of this immovable object and an irresistible force that keeps popping up in different uh, settings, and, we'll con and it's one of the most interesting problems, I think, that we face in coming to grips with how we use technology as individuals and organizations and, and, and society. So I just think it's one of the most interesting um, issues. And with that, I will have left a few minutes for questions, so thank you. More comments, yeah. Gary. Um, over a time period, there's change in the organization as well. There's people who were today a worker, uh, in five years, they're a middle manager and so on. To what extent have you looked at that, that as people's roles migrate, they may have gotten used to a technology as a worker, and now they're a manager and they see it all differently than the managers did five years ago. So the, the people in these roles changes over time. And what yeah. does that have on it? Right, so yeah, so what we were doing was the cross-sectional trend study doesn't, there you would actually want to do a longitudinal analysis looking at the same individuals over time. Um, the, yeah, and the trend study won't give you that sort of information directly. Um, but there are, you know, so there are just indications there from the fact that the managers, you know, as, as a, so the managers were skeptical about social networking sites being useful early on later um, but it's but they could have been they could have been the managers in 2012 could have been workers in 2008. yeah that yeah I'm agreeing that's yes yeah, so you're right so it could be yeah some of them some of them could have been but so we didn't sp specifically look at that it would be it would be possible to get a I think the best way to do that would clearly be through a longitudinal study that, that looked at the same individuals the problem um, you might get a little bit at that by looking at what in fact the promotion rate is and you could sort of get some some indication of that, uh, and balancing it against the ages. Uh, in the beginning, though, we, we just had to, we couldn't, we, we were worried that when only a third of the employees were using the, the sites uh, at the beginning, we were telling them by doing the survey, a lot of them were just discovering that this was out there. And so that could influence their subsequent behavior, and almost certainly would, since one of the questions was, you know, have you heard of these sites? Uh, so we stayed away from doing longitudinal studies for that reason. But yeah, it's definitely correlational data here, and there are different causal, possible causal explanations. Um, you mentioned that text-based uh, systems 
are, aren't as valuable as GUI-based systems with our increased processing power. But a lot of uh, programmers like text-based editors. Is there still a place for text-based systems going forward productivity-wise? So yeah, you've touched on one of the key arguments that raged, particularly in that era when the graphical user interface came out. Um, and I think, and yeah, so the, so the answer I think is yes, that clearly a power user can work efficiently with text, even with single letter commands, if you look at order entry, you know, or, or airplane reservation people, you know, they're, they're often using very abbreviated, very fast, efficient input methods and, and programmers. The, um, personally, I, you know, some of us held on to the notion that the GUI wasn't going to succeed. In fact, if you read one of the most influential books in HCI is, was the user-centered system design book that, that uh, Steve Draper and Don Norman published back in 1985, and they have a chapter in that on direct manipulation interfaces, which gets at this exact issue about because this was in 1985, and so they're looking at what are the advantages of a tech, you know, of a, of a command interface, and what are the advantages of a GUI, and they sort of weigh the pros and the cons, and they say, will the GUI succeed or will it go away? Uh, we don't know. You know, maybe it will. Well, the, the, for, but at that time, almost all of the computer users, the hand-on user, hands-on users of computers, were programmers. That was the profession that first, you know, and then there were some secretary, but even in the, you know. In the early days, it was they were too expensive. Interactive terminals to mainframes or to mini computers were too expensive, even for secretaries or admins to use. Programmers, I, the first time I used them was as when I was working as a computer programmer, um, and so the and many of the early studies in like the Kai conference were of empirical studies of programming, and so because programmers were the first hands-on users to a very large degree. And once the GUI came along and the price came down, of course, now they're not a, a large force in the market. And you will be hard pressed to find any papers in HCI conferences that talk about command interfaces or uh, improving them. So, so I think you're, you're right that they, they still have a use. But what we realized was we thought we were putting together the underlying theory that would explain, allow us to design for all systems without doing any user testing because we just understand the underlying psychology of using command names and command abbreviations. And we realized that once you had interfaces that had sound and color and when, you know, menus popping up and dropping down and it, it was just such a large design space that we could never really pin it down, you know, we could never pin that down scientifically completely. <coughs> and so it was so those who really thought everybody would be building on this work on command names and command abbreviations were realized that nobody was going to be citing those papers anymore or studying them. And as I said, some of my friends were very depressed about it. And my view was, let's quickly publish what we've done before everybody notices that it's not <laughs> going to be relevant much longer, and then move on and do something else. So, and that's part of my reason for bringing in the Moore's Law, was that I had to change as a software engineer my whole direction changed because the skills I had, when I took time out to go to graduate school, my skills had completely atrophied. I was very good at programming where memory was the primary constraint. You just would do anything to reduce the size of the program. When I came back, that was not, that was, memory was a lot cheaper. That was not, the, you know, actually having code that was maintainable, if somebody else could understand it, it had actually become more important. Um, so. So I, I saw one, and that was a direct effect of the declining cost of memory of Moore's law and related, related phenomena. And similarly, in the interface area, I had to change my focus because of that change coming along. And that's part of why I think if you can anticipate a little better than I did and my friends did um, what's coming, it, it's worth doing. Because when it comes, when the change happens, it's going to happen fast. Yeah. So this, this is very amusing. For example, do you see gesture-based interfaces now condemning GUIs to obsolescence? It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, a lot of people do see that. I haven't really tried to think hard about that, but some of my colleagues certainly are, are, are wondering if that might be the case. Yeah. So you spoke about these changes and, sh and kind of leaps in terms of the popularity of certain 
communication media such as email, text, and now social media. Do you feel that once these new technologies become more prevalent, does it do anything to the inherent structure, uh, the organizational structure on the company that they're using them, even though you still have positions such as managers? You know? Yeah, well, I, I tend to think so. I mean, that's something, Tom Malone is somebody who, you know, who forecast that back in the, in the 80s that you would see flattening and, and, uh, and it's just, it seems pretty clear to me. You would not believe how, even in a liberal tech company, particularly on the East Coast, you know, the West Coast is always a little bit different in the 70s and 80s, but uh, you would just not believe how hierarchical and, and structured they were, and that has just gone away. I mean, I, it was completely out of line for an individual contributor to talk to another manager or a second level manager without their manager being present in, in a lot of places. That, and of course there are industries, oil industry, there are a lot of industries that are still a lot more conservative, but it, I think there have just been big differences and I think a lot of it is you just can't have that level of siloing and hierarchy when people, when all this technology is out there and the communication capability. And it's just much more efficient to be able to bypass things when it makes sense to bypass. So, yeah, I think there's, I, so that's somebody, you know, that's my view, and it could be wrong, uh, but uh, it just feels that way. Uh, yeah, and I guess kind of to that, do you think that that's kind of changing an irresistible force that maybe people had? Like, is, the, is that an indication of anything at a social level? Or is it? I mean, is it changing like, cause human nature? Because you're talking about immovable objects and irresistible force, right? The force to kind of want to have that hierarchy, but is that, is that being curved by the technology, or is it? Well, I think it's being that. I mean, I think that's exactly the kind of question that you have. That that exactly how far? I think that the so the wiki example I gave, where if I'm the expert on this area, do you feel comfortable coming in and just editing my page, even when I invite you and really may want you to? A lot of people don't, you know, and that gets at this issue of I think of. There is still some sense of hierarchy, and, and maybe it should, you know, and maybe that's more efficient, and maybe that's, you know, I'm not saying it's inappropriate, but that's where you start, you do see these tensions. And of course, as you said, there still is our managers, and they still have, um, but the whole issue that, you know, is it going more it's towards managers as facilitators versus managers as, you know, as top down generals and so forth, you know, that's uh, another question. Uh, John, let's take one more question. Okay. Um, you, well, it's, it's, well, <laughs> you pick. <laughs> I don't want. Okay, okay, but, well, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Very nice. Uh, I have one question. So, you talked about how Facebook and LinkedIn now was used more and within the organization, and you came with the example, for example, how people will look for what kind of competences do you need uh, to uh, further develop yourself. But did you have uh, some example of the actual work practices where they were collaborating with each other, which they use Facebook for? Were there somewhere in your data where they talked about, well, we use this to coordinate this activity or something like that? So professional, I mean, Facebook has these <coughs> issues about the fact that not everybody, so there's certain things that you can't, uh, that you shouldn't be, you know, that that you can't do very easily coordinating internally, but professional organization, but professional activities that are not company confidential, yes, yeah, people do that. They set up pages. You know, IBM had second had islands and Second Life that they were using internally, um, and so so you do see quite a bit as long as it's not confidential. When it's confidential, then uh, you know, then they're not going to organize those activities online. But there's yeah, there is quite a bit. And of course, there's also the um, marketing side and the you know and the, the that does make heavy use of those technologies as well. So, um, but I, but again, I think a big you just need a big use of it. One use that a lot of people emphasize for internal is that they just knew a lot about what their colleagues were doing. They knew what moods they were likely to be in. They knew. They could walk into a meeting and congratulate somebody, your daughter got into Stanford, the person would be happy, the meeting would, and then they could get right into the meeting without having to say what's been going on in your life. And so it was just very efficient to just know things. I've seen meetings where two people uh, in the company meet and who haven't talked to each other for a while, and they just, because they have been Facebook friends, they know 
so much of this context, it's just amazing to see how they just use that to quickly discuss that a little bit, but also get into what the implications might be, and then to just get on a pretty strong interpersonal feeling about, you know, towards each other, which of course can help when you're working with people. So I think a lot of it, and that's extremely hard to measure, but uh, you know, what the actual impact on the work output is. But it, you, you see a lot of people are doing that. And then, you know, I, you know, and then you walk in, I walked in, and not everybody has that view, you know, I walked into one meeting with the vice president and who had said that he was not very keen about social networking use in the organization. And so to, I started phrasing it net neutrally. I was saying, you know, some people think that this could really be used to, to sort of increase the, 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 you know, to use positive effect and increase the sort of the social relations. And some people think it's a productivity. And he said, kill her, and slammed down his, 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 his fist. And so, you know, so it's, uh, um, so it's. Okay, and on that note. <laughs>